Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Turning to Mary, Mother of the Lord, and our Mother, let us pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. We began last evening with our uh, talk on virtue. Uh, I'm not going to go through it right now and recap it because the uh, topic that in this hour is uh, very rich and I'll run out of time if I uh, b go back. I am going to recap, though, probably in the, uh, the following conference. So I want to launch right into the theological virtues uh, this morning. The human virtues are rooted in the theological virtues, which adapt man's faculties for participation in the divine nature. For the theological virtues relate directly to God. They dispose Christians to live in a relationship with the Most Holy Trinity. They have the one and triune God for their origin, motive, and object. As I told you last evening, the theological virtues uh, are unlike the uh, human virtues. Uh, they're not something you will necessarily acquire. You can acquire them through human effort. We, we acquire them through baptism. The theological virtues are faith, hope, and charity. And those are infused into the soul when we are baptized. So they're a gift from God. Um, certainly, though, like all virtue, uh, we practice those virtues, and practice then perfects the virtue. Okay. The theological virtues are the foundation of Christian moral activity. They animate it, and they give it its special character. They inform and give life to all the moral virtues. They are infused by God into the souls of the faithful to make them capable of acting as children of God. They are the pledge of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit in the faculties of the human being. And the theological virtues, once again, are faith, hope, and charity. Words are of enormous importance. I've said that so many times in teaching and in preaching. I think we've forgotten it um, in recent years. Well, we've forgotten it all through history, uh, and maybe not just forgotten it. We, we've uh, had uh, help from the enemies of reason, the enemies of morality. Words are important. How important are words? Well, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have a crisis of words today, and it manifests itself in so many different ways. So we, we need to uh, pay attention to words. Um, the word virtue, actually, you know, if you study the Latin root and so forth, has to do with power. Virtue is power. Where does the power come from? God, right? Uh, it's true that we, we have to do our part, but God does his. God will provide the grace and the virtue then is animated by the power of grace. Now, we have to do our part, too. It's a collaborative effort. God does his part. We do our part. What's our part? Our part is the exercise uh, of virtue. We have to do it. You know? just, just do it. You, you, have to, you have to exercise faith. Faith is infused, yes. But then you want to exercise faith. What is Faith. Well, faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. Now, if you understood, you know, if you could, if you could uh, take those words in with understanding, you could stop right there, and you'd have it. The theological virtue by which we believe in God. But 
we've got to go on. The definition continues to help to shed light on the first part. And believe all that God has said and revealed to us. And at that point, I could stop and say, how are you going to uh, believe it? How are you going to give the ascent of faith if you don't know what it is? A certain amount of effort is required. I'm amazed. and I, Well, I'm not amazed anymore. I, I say that. I used to be amazed. I'm not amazed anymore how many Catholics just don't care. And they don't know a silly thing about their faith. Nothing. Do you know why we have lost millions of Catholics in many regions of the the church? I'll tell you why they've left. Because they didn't know what they had. That is why they left. I remember being invited to a meeting in Central America of bishops. They were having a synod. And I happened to be in Central America preaching at the time. And one bishop said, why don't you come with me tomorrow to our meeting? And so I did. And they were, uh, among other things, discussing the very serious problem that they had of um, defections, Catholics leaving to go to other religions, go to Catholics leaving the Catholic Church to go to the Jehovah's Witnesses, to go to the Mormons, to go to the Assemblies of God, to go to all different religions. And they were trying to figure it out. And uh, in due time, out of courtesy, they, one of them said to me, well, what do you think about it? You're, you're, you know, you're not one of us. Sometimes when you're in the problem, you can't see it. You're an outsider. Maybe you can see better than we can. What do you think? What, what do you, what's the cause of this crisis? And in my shy, retiring, <laughs> humble style, I said, why, you are. <laughs> with all due respect you're the cause of it why? because you've allowed every aberration under the sun to come into your respective jurisdictions you've allowed so called liberation theology to push the authentic faith out you haven't taught the ten commandments and the seven sacraments you haven't stuck to the basics So, when any vagrant wind of false doctrine or novelty blows in any open window, the people, sheep that they are, Jesus called us sheep for a reason, you know that? Uh, I don't know if you've ever been around sheep. I've been around sheep. When I lived in Spain, that's sheep country. Now, I used to go out and walk in the hills, and there's always a a shepherd with the, with the sheep. Jesus spoke in those agrarian terms because people could understand it. Now, nowadays, we don't understand it quite as well because we don't have immediate experience. But I'll tell you, sheep aren't too swift. That's the bottom line. Sheep just aren't very intelligent. Sheep are prone to make fatal errors. They need a shepherd. And hence my comment, and it was meant to be a respectful comment. I wasn't trying to be um, tear them down, but I, I meant it. I was deadly serious. It's your fault. You've permitted this. You've facilitated it. You enabled it. Those are some of the ways we can sin, by the way, that I just enumerated. You don't just sin by commission. You can sin by omission. You can sin by looking the other way, by a nod and a wink. You can sin terribly that way. So, what happened? The faithful defected. They went here, there, and everywhere, such that in the previous three years, those bishops had lost over five million Catholics in their respective dioceses. Why? They lost by default. We have the fullness of revealed truth. We have the fullness of God's revelation. We have seven sacraments, not just two. You have to remember, five of the seven sacraments require the ministerial priesthood. 
Protestants, God bless them and I love them. They have baptism and matrimony. Those two sacraments are valid. They don't require a priest, ministerial priest. Five of the seven require a validly ordained priest. We have all seven. So why did they leave? I'll tell you why they left. They didn't know what they had. That's why they left. We're un uninformed, uneducated, maleducated. Faith is the theological virtue by which we believe in God. Believe everything God has said and revealed to us. Now, in order to believe it, give the assent of faith, the obedience of faith. You know, that, that comes from a Latin, ob audere. What do we assent to? What's heard? That's what we assent to. What's heard? How, you know, how are you going to hear it if you're not listening? And how are you going to hear it unless someone preaches and teaches? That's the... Scripture say. And so, faith, we believe everything God has said and revealed. That, in, that involves a certain amount of listening, hearing, a certain amount of study, a certain amount of education. Uh, that's why, by the way, in recent years, the devil has taken the high ground. The high ground is education. The high ground is formation. You take the high ground, you control the outcome of the battle. Any commander knows that. And that's what's happened. We've had an undermining of education, novitiates, universities, seminaries, the high ground, very often taken by the enemy. So we believe everything that God has said and revealed to us, and we believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief, and as I've said before, it says everything. It doesn't say some of, part of, or a percentage of. If we have the theological virtue of faith, we believe in God, we believe everything God has said and revealed to us, we believe everything, everything, everything. Holy Church proposes for our belief because he who has revealed it is God or is truth itself. Why do we believe? This is important now. Why do we believe? Most people don't get that part of it, and that's why they get it wrong. Do we believe because it sounds plausible? It makes sense. No, that's not why we believe. That's not faith. We believe because he who has revealed it is truth itself, God. That's why we believe. The one who can neither deceive nor be deceived. God Almighty. Now that's faith. That's the theological virtue of faith. To believe in God, to believe everything God has said and revealed to us, to believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief because he who has revealed it is truth itself. I can tell you something. that I have... As some of you know very well, I have all kinds of defects. I, I do. I am as deficient as a human being can be. I got a lot of defects. But I can tell you one thing. Right, looking, I can look you in the eye and I can tell you this with 100% certitude. I believe everything the Holy Catholic Church teaches. I believe it all. Every bit of it, I don't profess to understand it all perfectly. I can't. I'd be God if I could understand it perfectly. But I believe every bit of it. Everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. That's a gift. That's something that's infused. I can't take credit for it. God's given me that. What's our part? Our part is disposition, to be well disposed. There's an old saying, things are received according to the mode of the receiver. In other words, you, you receive what you're able to, what you're disposed to receive. Are you open to the truth? Two dimensions to the faith, as St. Thomas taught, the subjective and the objective. The faith has to do with the truth. 
The truth isn't something. The truth is somebody. All truth that truly is subsists in him who is the truth. God. So we're not talking about something. We're talking about somebody. God. The quintessential, objective, absolute truth. The one who is. I am who I am. That's the object of faith. Truth. God. And then we have a subjective dimension. When I say in the Apostles' Creed, I believe. What am I saying? I believe what we believe. I believe. That's a statement concerning my subjective disposition. I believe not just anything. When I say the Apostles' Creed, I don't, when I say I believe, I don't believe just anything. I believe something very definite. I believe what we believe. Now, who's the we? And this is important. Of course, when we profess the Nicene Creed, we say we believe one God. I believe what we believe. Who's the we? The church. Now, very often you'll hear it in certain circles proclaimed, we are church. And very often that is a, if you have ears for the symphony of truth, that is a discordant note, very often. We are church, and what they mean is, what we say goes. A consensus. In other words, if we vote on it, it is. If we decide that women can be ordained priests, then they can. We are church. Happy horse manure. (laughs) In plain English. No, no, that's not what it means. I believe what we believe. Who's the we? All the blessed in heaven. All the souls in purgatory on their way to heaven. And all those on earth in union with all of the above in virtue of the same faith. Now, when I say the same faith, that's an objective thing. The objective dimension of faith, the object of faith. Truth, God. It's very definite, well-defined. I don't just believe anything. I believe what we believe. And the we is the authentic church. That's faith. And the gift of faith remains in one who has not sinned against it. Ooh, let me repeat that. The gift of faith remains in one who has not sinned against it. How did we receive the gift of faith? Baptism. Can you lose the gift of faith? Indeed you can. How? By sinning against the gift of faith. But faith, apart from works is dead. Letter to James. When when faith is deprived of hope and charity, faith does not fully unite the believer to Christ and does not make him a living member of his body. I could go on a very long time commenting on that statement. Sin, serious sin, separates us from the body of Christ. Probably someone who is excommunicated will someday try to excommunicate me. There are certain things, certain acts, that result in automatic excommunication. An example. Um, Knowing, willing... Abortion, or having something to do with that. Performing an abortion, having one, procuring one, whatever. Knowingly. Now, if you don't know, you can't incur the canonical penalty. And a lot of times, poor women that have abortion, they don't know. They don't, they don't know. Uh, exa- they know it's wrong very often, but they don't realize the canonical penalty. So they're not excommunicated, in fact. But if you have knowledge and full consent of the will... You're separated. 
I am convinced in my own mind. Here's what, how I'll probably get booted out someday, maybe, if my hour comes. So, somebody, a Catholic, a priest, a bishop, a theologian, whoever, doesn't matter who he is. Of course, it's worse when you have a higher authority. Holds a position that contradicts the essential teaching of the faith. Teaching in faith and morals. Well, under certain circumstances, a woman might have an abortion. Or, even, even this. Artificial contraception. Oh, well, listen, if it's not, if, if you don't, if your conscience doesn't bother you about it, you can go ahead and do that. Now, that's a common one. I've actually had face-to-face -face conversations with bishops who have said that to me. I hold that that is a direct contradiction of something we believe. Pope Paul VI, historic, heroic, teaching in Humanae Vitae, which was much maligned and still is in certain circles, that constitutes part of the church's teaching, the ordinary magisterium. For someone to take a position, I don't care who you are, lay person, religious priest, bishop, theologian, you're Catholic, and you take a position and say, oh, oh that, he's wrong, as a bishop said to my face one time. Until we come out and publicly denounce Paul VI, we're wasting our time in moral theology. That's what he said. That is heresy by definition. Now, we are too pol polite today to use terms like that. You know, that, that's like a, even though it has more than four letters, it's like an ecclesial four-letter word. You just don't use that in polite society. I'm not that polite. Heresy is an obstinate post-baptismal. Now note what it says. Obstinate. That, that's a, an interesting word. An obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith or morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning same. St. Thomas Aquinas talked about these things, in his exposition on faith. What is the automatic and immediate penalty for heresy? Excommunication. Late sententiae. Ipso facto. In virtue of the act itself, you cut yourself off, and it doesn't require the further act of a bishop to confirm it. There are certain things, heresy is one of them, which results in immediate, automatic excommunication. What happens? You become a dead member of the body of Christ. And that goes a long way toward explaining why we have so much death in certain regions of the body. Dead things transmit life. No thing. We can sin against faith many different ways. St. Thomas uh, enumerates some of those in his second part of the second part. Heresy is one of them. I just talked about that, heresy, you know the definition. Now, if I ask you, we're, by the way, too, we, have, we have a final exam tomorrow. <laughs> and I know you are, you're all going to get A+, plus, 100%. But that could be one of the questions. If I say to you, what is heresy? You know, I be, believe you me, in most places, roundly criticized for even talking about such things. You know, we don't use that, those words, these days. Words are important. I don't like to accentuate the negative. I like to accentuate the positive. But you can't leave out 
the negative. I remember one time a bishop, a good bishop, he said to me, now John, he said a lot of things to me. He's a very good bishop, and I've tortured this bishop for years, <laughs> and he has done the same to me. And he's really, he's a good man. He's, he, he, he said to me when I first went to help him, he said, now John, I want you to be smooth. <laughs> John, I want you to be smooth in order to gain a constituency. I swear those were his exact words. I want you to be smooth in order to gain a constituency. And I looked at him and I said, you've been a bishop too long. What are you, a politician? Be smooth, me? In order to gain a constituency, indeed. Well, he meant well. He said a lot of other things to me as well. Some of them good, some of them indicative of him having been a bishop for almost 20 years, having to operate in certain political circles. Apostasy. That's another way you can sin against faith. Apostasy, in the simple sense of the word, is the renouncing of the faith. Hence, apostasy is a sin of unbelief, as St. Thomas teaches. In Catholic countries, for instance, we don't have too many Catholic countries left, but in Catholic countries, a ruler who proves apostate is upon excommunication justly deprived of the allegiance of his subjects. We have uh, a kind of tacit, de facto apostasy uh, many places. Now, when I lived in Spain, now Spain w was a, a country you could call it a Catholic country. Uh, I don't know if you can call it such now. I'm not sure where the, the line is for the definition. Portugal would be called a Catholic country still. When I lived in Spain, all the children, the, the school children now in public school, not parochial school, the children in the public schools, every first Friday, you could see them marching through the streets. You know where they were going? They were going to confession. That was still a... Uh, fact of life in, in Spain, in the public schools. First Friday, kids would march off to the local parish to go to confession. The uh, priest's salary was paid by the government. When I lived in Spain, the priests were still paid their salary, not by the church, by the government. That's interesting. Can, can you imagine in this country if Congress had to vote on an appropriation like that, oh, the doggone priests, they're asking for another raise. <laughs> Can you imagine they want $80 a week now? <laughs> In Catholic countries, Catholic rulers would have a, an obligation. How about, how about in the Catholic Church, rulers, leaders, would have an obligation to teach rightly, to hand on faithfully what they have received. That's like when we sit, talk about catechesis. Again, words are important. Uh, it comes from a Greek, catechal. To echo back faithfully. We give the obedience of faith to something we've heard. We've heard the preaching. We've heard the teaching. The, the church gives us what she herself has received. She hands it on faithfully. We hear it. We give the assent of faith. And then we catechize. We echo back faithfully what we have received. It's catech catechesis. Apostasy would be to rebel from that authentic teaching. Blasphemy is a sin against faith, St. Thomas teaches. It's a direct disparaging of the divine goodness. It is therefore a sin in conflict with the faith. For he who has the faith confesses to the divine goodness. Blasphemy by its genus or the general essential class of sins to which it belongs is always a mortal sin. Now, don't 
Don't uh, panic if you think in a bad moment you blaspheme God. A mortal sin still, you know, what St. Thomas is talking about here is, is the, the matter, as we say. There are three constituent parts that determine if a, if a sin is fatal, mortal, if it separates you from God. Number one, grave matter. Okay, And what he's saying is this is always grave matter. Blasphemy is always grave matter. However, there have to be two other things simultaneously in place with that in order to have a mortal sin subjectively imputed. Number two would be knowledge. You have to know that this is a serious sin. And three, you have to give full consent of the will in the light of that knowledge. All three have to be simultaneously in place to have a mortal sin subjectively imputed. The sin against the Holy Spirit. St. Augustine, so this is St. Thomas talking here, St. Augustine says that the sin against the Holy Spirit mentioned specifically in Scripture, now that's in Matthew 12, 31. And I'm at, by the way, I'm asked that question all the time. I think we're going to have a question and answer at the end of this retreat. One of the questions that is common, I've been asked it many, many times, is, uh, but what about the sin against the Holy Spirit, you know, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit? Um, and people want to know what that is because, um, you know, that one, there's no coming back from that, Scripture says. Well, St. Augustine says that that is final impenitence. St. Thomas is here quoting the great father and doctor, St. Augustine. Final impenitence, by which a man rejects grace and pardon up to and including the moment of his death. I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't, I've never seen it, personally, thank God. I, I think it would be a terrifying thing uh, to ever see that. I, thanks be to God, I, now, I have been with horrible criminals, um, mass murderers, degenerates and immoral characters of every description at the hour of their death. And I have never once seen this, thank God. I've never seen final impenitence. It could happen. It happens, I guess. But I've never personally seen it. There's an old saying. I like it. There are no atheists in foxholes. When you come to the decisive moment and you know very well you're going to check out any minute now. You can go your whole life and be a wise guy. You can be a professed atheist. Oh, I don't believe that stuff. And then you come right up to the end. And grace starts to work. God gives sufficient grace to every single soul to be saved. And that's a fact. Now, it is true that, that we can reject grace. But it's a powerful thing. And I thank God that every one of these cases that I've ever seen, they, they repent at the end. But what is that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. Final impenitence. That's a sin against faith. Okay? St. Thomas here in the Segunda Segunda is talking about sins against faith. Okay? And that's one of the ways you can do it. That's the sin against the Holy Spirit. Final impenitence. Now, vices opposed to knowledge and understanding. A person who turns away his mind from all consideration of God, or who so busies himself with created things that he has no time to think of God and of his own soul's needs, is subject to mental and spiritual blindness insofar as this is a person's own fault, it is sin, St. Thomas teaches a person who turns his mind away from... Now, uh, you know, we may think of the person out there, right? The person out there in the world who is so preoccupied with created things, with making money, doing whatever he feels he needs to do, that he just doesn't think about God. Nor does he care to, 
to the extent that that's his own fault, that he's aware of it and does it anyway, that's sin. And serious sin. It's a sin against faith. Now, by the way, sins against faith are sins against the first commandment, as are sins against hope and charity. Sins against the theological virtues are sins against the first commandment, to love God. You know, there's only one God. To put no false gods before him. False gods. What are false gods? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Those are three. Right? Money? False gods. We, and believe you me, there are millions of people who engage in that form of idolatry. Money becomes an idol. Promiscuous sexuality, an idol. All kinds of idols erected in place of the one true God. Sins against the first commandment. Sins against faith, hope, and charity. Now, in addition to the the folks out there, we in here can also be guilty of these vices that are opposed to knowledge and understanding, vices opposed to faith, vices opposed or against the first commandment. We can do that. I mentioned to you in the homily this morning how, how, how sad I've been this past year at, at some of our brothers who, who've fallen. And, and I don't... I, not a word that I speak in that context is, is meant to be in criticism or condemnation or judgment. Except for the grace of God, there go I. The passage I've repeated over and over and over this past year is what Jesus said. Let he among you who is without sin cast the first stone. When they brought the woman caught red-handed in adultery, and you know, Mosaic law prescribed stoning to death for that sin. What did Jesus say to them? You know, they, they wanted to, they were testing him. And, and they, they knew what the law said, and they wanted to see what he was going to do. They also knew the, the mercy of this man that they couldn't understand. They were testing him. And what did he say to them? A very, very insightful thing. He said, let him among you who is without sin cast the first stone. Go ahead. Let's see. Who? Who never committed a sin? Pick up the first stone and throw it. You remember what it says that, that he did, you know, all the, the elders of, of the, the synagogue had come. They brought this woman, Pharisees, in more ways than one. And what did Jesus do? It says that he bent down, and he wrote, he traced in the dirt. And then he stood up, let him among you as well sin cast the first stone. He bent down and he traced some more in the dirt. And it says that they began to go away... The eldest first. Some commentators say that he was writing their sins in the dirt. And the eldest, having acquired a certain amount of self-knowledge, they left the party. Why? They recognized their sins. You know, if they didn't recognize them on their own at first, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. You know, maybe they're hard-hearted, hard-headed. If I said to you, you're trying to accuse somebody, and you, you oh, let's string this guy up. And I said, you throw the first stone. You put the rope up there. And then you were still opposite, and I bent down, and I wrote your specific worst sin. In the dirt. You know, maybe even the one you forgot about when you were 19 years old and you had more hormones than brains. <laughs> and I wrote that in the dirt. You might tend to clam up and get out. That's what he did. That's what he did. Sins against faith are sins against hope And they are sins against charity. The theological virtues, there's a Trinitarian 
analogy that can be made. There's one God. Well, virtue, in a sense, is one. In a very real sense, virtue is one. Why? What does virtue do? It makes you like God. What's the purpose of virtue? To make you like God. To conform you to Jesus Christ. Whose image are we we creating? We're creating God's image, right? We know that. We're created in the image and likeness of God. Well, Well, what's that? Well, Scripture tells us. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And so Jesus is the one we have to look at. What does virtue do? It makes us Christ-like. We become who we are. The image becomes more clear. We become children of God in Jesus, the only Son of the Father. That's virtue. Virtue is one. God is one. The theological virtues are three. Kind of like the Trinity, right? One God, three divine persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Theological virtues, faith, hope, charity. There, there's an analogy to be made because what we're talking about here, remember, always come back to what we're talking about. We're not talking about something. We're talking about somebody. Okay, we're talking about God. Theology studies God and all other things as they relate to God. And so... The theological virtues make us like God. There's one God, three divine persons. We say in theology that the three divine per- persons, that you, wherever one of them is, there the other two must be, in virtue of what we call the divine perichoresis or circumcision. Wherever the Father is, there the Son and the Holy Spirit must be. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, There the Father and the Son must be. You can't artificially separate God. One God, three divine persons. Same thing with the theological virtues. Wherever you find authentic faith, the theological virtue of faith, you're going to find hope. And you're going to find charity. Otherwise, faith is dead. You know? Faith without works? Show me your faith. I'll show you my works. St. James says. And so, that's very important. They articulate those those, um, theological virtues. They articulate. They constitute a oneness and integrity. They are compenetrated, interconnected, faith, hope, and charity. If you don't have hope, then you don't have faith. Why? If you believe everything God has said and revealed to us, you believe in his mercy. So you've got to have hope. What's hope? Hope is a desire. Hope is the theological virtue by which we desire heaven and eternal life. We trust. What do we trust in? We trust in the promises of Christ. And what do we rely on? Ourself? We rely on our own strength? Mm -mm. We rely on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. That is the theological virtue of hope. You can't have faith without hope. And you can't have faith without charity. What's charity? The theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake. Not not because of what he can do for us, but because he's God. And he deserves our our love. And we love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. If you have authentic faith, if you have the theological virtue of faith, you're going to have hope and you're going to have charity as well. You have to. Otherwise, you don't have authentic faith. Why? Because you don't believe everything God has said and revealed to us. You don't believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief. So you see the interconnection among the, the theological virtues. It's a package. It all goes together. But don't, as some of the saints used to say, don't break your head trying to think how that all works. You don't have to do that consciously. You don't have to say, let's see, which, which ones did I, did I leave out? 
Believe you me, the ones that you're not doing so good at, and they'll be made abundantly clear to you, right? Whatever it is that you're lacking, if you're lacking in patience, that's going to manifest itself to you, and you're going to know to pray for that and to work on that. If you're, you're faltering in faith, uh, I thank God that, that um, I guess I have so many other things to worry about and to do, that that, that one... Uh, that one hasn't been a problem. God's preserved me from trials of faith. I, I just don't have a problem with belief. It's just, it's just there. Uh, I don't have to wrestle with that. But I have known many people who've had to wrestle with that. They, they just can't. So they say, oh, I don't know if, if that's true. You ever meet people who think too much? <laughs> you know? I mean, th- now thinking's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. God gave us a brain. And it, and it has a function, we ought to use it. So it's a good thing. But sometimes people just wear themselves out trying to rationally convince themselves. Remember, I, I said that last night. The people Actually, people say this to me. They say to me, if you can explain the Trinity to me, I'll become Catholic. I'm, you know, that's, a que- that's such a question. Satan himself must be posing that question. I think he's the only one smart enough. He's a f- f- bright, fallen angel to, to ask a question like that. You know, well, if you can p- explain, and they mean, you know, fully and rationally articulate exactly what the Trinity is. I can say certain things about the Trinity. I, can, I know, I can tell you what the church has to say about the most holy Trinity. But I guarantee you that isn't much compared to what it is. Just not. Um, People say, well, if you can explain to me how Jesus is really, truly, and substantially present in the Eucharist, blessed sacrament, why, I'll become Catholic right away. And I know what they're doing. They're trying to trip me up. And I always do it. Hey, I'm a kindergarten teacher. Always have been. The day I received my doctorate in Europe, my mentor, the director of my thesis, said to me, you've now earned five university degrees. You've earned your doctorate and your other degrees with highest honors. I now, what are you going to do? At what level will you teach, Father? And I didn't even have to think about it. I said kindergarten. (laughs) Now, he expected that I would say in the seminary or I'll teach master's degree, licentiate or doctorate, candidates. That's what he thought I would say. He said, well, my superiors, after they spent all that time and money educating me, they'll certainly put me in a place where they can, nah, I'm teaching kindergarten. And by the way, that's probably the most important level. It's the most formative, right? You, You form the little minds. You make them receptive. I'm a kindergarten teacher. Always have, always will be. Basics. Simple truth, taught simply. And so, faith. That's something that I haven't really had to struggle with, but I know some people do. I believe it all. That doesn't necessarily mean that I have an easy time living it all. At times, I become exasperated. At times, I don't manifest as much hope as I should, although I know with absolute certainty there's a God in heaven and that he's faithful and that he will do everything he said he will for, and I know his mercy is absolute. I know that, but I don't always act like that. Sometimes I'm beaten down by the battle. Maybe you are too. Faith. That's what you need to hold on to. Faith, and then pray for the grace to put faith in action. What's faith in action? Love, faith, the theological virtue by which we believe in God, believe everything God has said and revealed to us, believe everything Holy Church proposes for our belief, because he who has revealed it is truth itself. That's why I believe it. Why? Because God has revealed it. God's not a liar and a deceiver. God can neither deceive nor be deceived. I believe it all because he has revealed it. That's faith. Hope. 
theological virtue by which we desire the kingdom of heaven and eternal life as our happiness. And remember, that's what hope is. If you hope, put all your hope in money, worldly happiness, whatever, you're not going to be happy. We need some of those things. I agree. But your overriding hope has to be for heaven. The kingdom of heaven, eternal life. You place your trust in Christ's promises and you rely not on your own strength. Boy, here's, that's a big one. You know, in our culture, uh, we're kind of trained, especially in our country where we're indoctrinated with this self-sufficiency, this independence. I had a lot of that. I, I, I've got that in my upbringing. You know, I'm an American through and through. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm the, the rugged individualist. And I got it in sports. You know, I, in order to be a good athlete, you've got to shed blood, sweat, and tears. I was willing to shed blood and sweat and tears. I was willing to work day and night, seven days a week, and if you're only working six, I'm going to whip you. In the Army, same thing. In the corporate world, same thing. And then God beat the snot out of me. <laughs> in plain English. And I learned what I, what I saw on a billboard one time in New York State, it was advertised in a Broadway play. Boy, it, it, it about caused a car wreck. I saw that big billboard and it said, your arms are too short to box with God. And it ain't that the truth. You know, sometimes we think we can argue and wrestle with God, but you're not going to win that one. Your arms are too short to box with God. That didn't come naturally to me. You know, I'd fuss and struggle and argue with God in my life. Wouldn't accept his will. And so he just beat me up. Allowed me to be homeless, drug addicted, useless, tossed in the gutter. Why? To punish me? No, to educate me. Oh, there was an element of punishment, yes. Element of justice in that, I deserved it. But it was more education than anything else. I learned that I just can't place my total trust in me because I'm deficient. I am finite. I am a creature. I will fall short. I will disappoint myself and I will disappoint you. And so will every other human being at one time or another. But I place my trust in Christ's promises I can never be disappointed. I rely not on my own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the gift who contains all gifts. Now that's hope. And charity, to love God above all things for his own sake, and to love our neighbor as ourselves out of love for God. And don't skip over that last part. Out of love for God. I cannot love you unless I love God first. And then I can love you out of love for God. I, I use the analogy of the vertical and horizontal dimensions of love. And it, once again, I have this wonderful big crucifix here in the chapel to illustrate the point. You see the, uh, the vertical beam of the cross? You know, the one that goes up and down. That illustrates our relationship with God. Right? God in us. Creator, the creature. The infinite, the finite. I've got to establish that first. My relationship with God. The vertical dimension of love. And then the horizontal dimension of love. That represents my relationship with you. 
with all of humanity, indeed all of creation. I can only love you when I've loved God first. You have to be plugged into the power in order to shine as the light of the world. And so you have the horizontal dimension of charity and the vertical dimension. The two go together. That's charity. Love God above all things for his own sake. And then I can love my neighbor as myself out of love for God. And remember what you get when you do all that. A cross. That's what you get. If I'm going to love God above all things for his own sake and I'm going to love you day in and day out, in season, out of season, convenient or inconvenient, man, I need power to do that. I need a lot of power to do that and I don't have it. But God does. The Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, the gift who contains all gift. Holy Spirit. He'll give me the strength and the power to love you as I should. Even to lay down my life as Jesus did. Me, I can't do it. I'm weak. I'm a quitter. And I'm lacking in every virtue. For man it is impossible. But for God, all things are possible.